Did you notice St. John's choice of words there? Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. Not miracles, signs. A miracle is something that's wondrous and supernatural, but that's really it. To read this story as a miracle might be some way of proving Jesus' power or his divinity, but that's about all we could get from it. A sign is something different. And St. John wants us to understand that what happens at this wedding is a sign, not just a miracle. Signs point to something. So the question is, to what is this sign pointing us? I remember as I read this that St. John begins his gospel by telling us that Jesus has come among us as the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. When we were stumbling around in darkness looking for God, God shined light on us to help us see, to give us signs to follow. No one has ever seen God, John reminds us. But the Son, who is close to the Father's heart, has seen them and has made them known. Whatever is happening in the story, I think it's intended to show us something about God. So as you read this story, what does it show you about God? Where do you see God in the action at this wedding? As I think on those questions... The first thing I notice is that thanks to Jesus, this party is a real rager. (laughs) As I understand it, at the time, wedding celebrations, which were, you know, some of the principal ways that people got together to celebrate, those celebrations lasted until the wine gave out. That wine was supplied by the friends and family of the bridegroom. And so how long the party lasted said something about how much people loved you, how much they were willing to contribute to this celebration in your honor. Maybe that was part of the reason behind Jesus' mother's concern here. Maybe she's worried that this is going to make the groom look bad or, worse yet, be taken as some sort of omen about the success of the marriage. There's no indication in the story that she expects Jesus to do anything supernatural necessarily, but she clearly hopes and expects that he will do something. Maybe she's hoping he'll get his new friends to kick in so they can keep the party going a while longer. But what he does is even better. These six stone jars, the text tells us, each hold 20 or 30 gallons. In total, that's the equivalent of between five to 800 bottles of wine. Wow. (laughs) I don't care how many guests are at that party, this is gonna go on a long time, right? Not only that, this is the good stuff. Now, it was considered poor form to serve cheap wine when people had already been drinking, but, I mean, that's what people are going to do, right? Because why would you waste good wine on folks whose senses are dulled and they can't really taste it anymore anyway? But you can imagine, right, that at this party that was beginning to wind down, this sudden influx of really good wine is just going to kick things right back up into high gear, right? There's something just beautifully simple about the image in this story. What happens at this wedding banquet. When Jesus acts, it's to show love to the bride and the groom at their wedding. To keep the festivities rolling. That's the first thing I see when I look at this story. And even with all the other symbolism that John packs in, that's probably one of the major themes that's going on here. Because wedding feasts are a common metaphor for the day of the Lord, or the coming of the Messiah. Think about Jesus' parables in the Synoptic Gospels, all those things that happen set at wedding banquets or wedding feasts, right? Or that rich imagery and revelation of the wedding feast of the Lamb as uh, the celebration of all, uh, all creation after the defeat of evil. The abundance of wine and thus celebration is an image used by the prophets throughout Scripture. Isaiah, 
and Joel and even cranky old Amos imagine the day of the Lord as a time when people will feast with well-aged wines strained clear, when the mountains will drip with sweet wine. Isn't that a lovely image? And as I reflect on that this week, I can't help but wonder when religion, for so many of us, became about judging and condemning ourselves or others based on actions or beliefs. Even those of us who are supposedly saved by grace worry about our children or our grandchildren who don't practice faith that we do, right? And I wonder, when did the joy and the celebration give way to fear of judgment? I must have missed the part of the story where Jesus went around interviewing all the guests first to decide whether or not they were worthy of this wine that he was about to create. It kind of reminds me of this wedding I was at several years ago. A couple of college friends were getting married and they asked me to preside at the ceremony for them. And at the reception afterwards, I remember watching the kids. This was a relatively small wedding. There was maybe a hundred guests, if that. And there was only a handful of kids, and um, they were all under the age of eight, except for there was two 12-year-olds, a boy and a girl. Well, of course, their families and everyone else at the party became intensely interested in getting these two kids to dance together. And of course, they were both terribly embarrassed about it. But what struck me was that as I watched this young man, I saw myself. I had always been the shy one growing up. I'd only dated a handful of times between middle school and college. Never, never was the one to ask anyone out. I had my share of crushes, but I was always afraid to act on them, too afraid of being rejected. And when I looked at this kid's face, I may have been projecting a little bit, but that's what I saw. I saw him thinking that just because he was the only other person her age at the party, what would make her want to dance with him, right? The difference was that having the uh, privilege of distance afforded by age and experience, I could look at the situation and see if the answer is obvious. It's just a dance, right? We're just having fun. That's what I never understood about life growing up. I always took it way too seriously. And I wonder in this story if maybe we do that with our faith too. I wonder if we take our faith far too seriously sometimes. If we're too concerned about doing the right things or believing the right things just to kick back and have some fun with this, to enjoy the party and experience this abundance of love that we've been given, right? I think back to those six stone jars. In scripture, six is a number that implies that something's missing. Seven is the number of wholeness and completeness and well-being. Six is almost there, but just short. These jars, John says, were used for religious rites, specifically the rites of purification, the rites that focused on our unworthiness and our need to make ourselves acceptable in some way before coming into God's presence. Given this context, I have to wonder if John is suggesting that faith which focuses on what we lack somehow falls short, if it's just not quite enough, if our faith only points out what's missing, where we or others are disappointing God or unworthy of God's love, is that faith serving us well? Is that doing what Jesus came to do? Is that the gospel, the good news? Or is it like those six stone jars, even full, just never quite enough? If that's the case, perhaps the good news in this story is that Jesus can take that cold, empty faith and fill it with something new. Not a sign of our insufficiency, but a sign instead of God's abundance. Even if you were raised thinking that good deeds or pure thoughts or a life of service are the only things that God loves. Even if you grew up being taught that there were people who were beyond God's desire or God's ability to save. 
The first sign of Jesus' ministry is to change that thin, stale love into the real thing, the good stuff, to help us enjoy the party a little longer. And I wonder if maybe that's one thing that this story is inviting us to do, to just enjoy the party, to look out and see the abundance of love that we have been given. When those kids at the wedding I was at finally did work up the courage to dance together after much cajoling, they had fun. In fact, they ended up hanging out for the rest of the evening, something that wouldn't have happened if they hadn't put their anxiety aside and just decided to give it a shot and have a good time for a moment. I wonder if we get so wrapped up in our hurts and our fears that we can't see past them to notice all there is to celebrate. It's not that those things aren't real or that they don't need addressing. The climate is changing. The pandemic is killing people. We make choices that hurt others and others make choices that hurt us. Those are real things and we can't pretend that they aren't. But we can't find our way out of the darkness by simply looking harder. Only light can show us the way. I wonder if maybe in this story there is a question about whether we will choose to dwell on those things, those hurts and those pains and those angers, and let those be what defines us, what defines our relationship with God, or whether we will open ourselves to look around and see the abundance around us, this sudden gift of abundant wine. Rather than hating what is evil, rather than fighting what is wrong, rather than focusing on what we don't have, what would happen if we instead turned our attention to God's abundance, to what we do have? What would happen if that became the guiding passion in our lives. My favorite prophecy about wine and the Messiah comes from a book that didn't make it into the Bible. It's the uh, Hebrew Bible uh, Apocalypse of Baruch. There the author writes that when Messiah comes, quote, the earth, the earth will also yield fruits 10,000 fold. On each vine shall be a thousand branches and each branch shall produce a thousand clusters, and each cluster produce a thousand grapes, and each grape will produce a core of wine. Now, a core is a unit of measurement roughly equivalent to 120 gallons. Just to give you a sense of the kind of abundance we're talking about here. Interestingly, 120 gallons is just about the amount of wine that Jesus creates in the story. I wonder if John knew that. I wonder if he did that on purpose. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But if he did, I wonder if he's hinting that what happens at this party, as extravagant as it is, 800 bottles of wine, if that is just a foretaste of the feast to come. All the signs in this story point to the climax of John's gospel. And that climax is Jesus' crucifixion, his hour when he glorifies God. That's the only other time Jesus' mother shows up in John's gospel. It's the time when just after sharing a meal of bread and wine, Jesus' blood is poured out just like that very wine. And it happens three days before his resurrection. All symbols that show up in this story. In that moment, Jesus reveals the abundance of God's love and what that love is capable of. It's that abundance that we share at this table. It's a sign to us that says that sin and evil and death can take and take and take, but they will never take more than God has to give. 
This is the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. The light shines forever in the darkness, and the darkness never overcomes it. The wine will never cease to flow, the bread will never give out, the body will never tire, the dance will never end. The only question left to us is whether we will have the courage or the joy or the whatever it takes to take the hand that God extends to us and join in that dance.